routes, but we're operating the North and South Main Street routes on a Saturday pattern and everything is running an hourly service. Um, we unfortunately are not able to run any service out to the GTCC campus in Jamestown. We have five drivers today, seven drivers on Tuesday, Wednesday, and then five again on Thursday, which is just bare minimum to get what we need to get done. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? It'll be, and it'll be like that for a couple of weeks, you figure? We are hoping that as long as no one else tests positive and folks don't have to stay quarantined, that we will go back to the service we were running last Wednesday, Thursday on Friday. Okay. But again, that depends on test results and sure. how many people still have to be quarantined. I understand. Mayor, if, if I may, mm -hmm. um, and Angela, um, one of the things that, that's kind of been pointed out is um, you, we, what you would expect is citizens to complain about um, the way the, the services are now. But one thing that I don't know if they're not getting, the, the city's done a really good job at putting the information out about the, the, the um, staff that tested positive and the challenges that it makes, um, that it presses on the department. What I've heard is people filming and complaining at the drivers that are there, which we're already down to a skeleton crew. I, somehow, I think it's important that we get the message out to the citizens that, you know, it's not their fault. And this whole issue is not the driver's fault. So stressing, the drivers that we have in place out is not helping the situation at all. And another thing is to remember when you when you talk about the, the, the amount of drivers and so that we have in there, we had trouble getting CDL drivers when times were good. It was already a challenge to try to acquire drivers as it is. So to, to remember that we, I, I don't want, I don't think anybody should put any undue stress on that department. And especially, especially from from you know this board or or from city, that we have to remember that they're going through the same challenges that everybody else is. <clears throat> the ones who have kids are now trying to find a way to put in place them and so forth. So just just wanted to kind of put that marker out there, and also uh, maybe uh, find a way to to educate or connect to the to the riders the links to the city site so they can stay. Because some of them were saying that they were not. They did not know when they showed up at the stop, even though they did a really good job of putting that information out, but sharing the links to the driver, to the transit, and most importantly, that they call before they go to their bus stops, before they go to ride, that it's important that they just call first before they go, so that they'll be informed that way. So if there's any way that we can help, um, I, I'm gonna do my little whatever I can in my corner, uh, just, just, saying, just putting this out to the body and also to, to the staff, there's a massive way to try to get this message out that it's important that we all play a part to try to help with this. And in all of this, the ridership is still free. It is still free. So just, just want to commend you for the work that you're doing and kind of put that information out there. So thank you. Thank you. How many drivers total have tested uh, positive? Right now, you mean total to date have tested today, positive? Yes. We have had seven to date who have tested positive. Out of a pool of how many? out of a pool of 27 drivers. And that is the pool as of now. I have a question. Is there, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about some of the citizens that use the transport, public transportation for jobs. Is there either somewhere that we can put on our website or offer folks? I mean, I know this sound, might sound silly, like a letter to your boss saying, you know, so that they can know that the bosses know that transportation has been limited and we'll you know, like excuse them if they're late or try to maybe throughout their business find ways for their employees to get to work. Have you heard of anything like that? I've not heard of anything, but um, we, we kind of do something similar when the bus is involved in an accident, then um, okay. we just have a little slip that the supervisor on the scene will fill out and sign and give to the employee just so that they can give something to their employer. Okay. I mean, we could do the same thing, um, just kind of create something for those folks who are going to work. And we understand that it is a challenge for them going to work. We are also just challenged too with the Absolutely. number of bodies we oh, have to provide service. You do a great job, Angela. You do a really good job. Thank you. Okay. 
Well, today I come to talk to you about a new federal requirement for the creation of a public transportation agency safety plan. Uh, right after COVID hit, I'd kind of given you all briefing number one, there was a PowerPoint presentation. And so today is to bring you up to date on where we are and then what the next steps that I'm going to ask of you. A quick review, what is a PTASP? It is an agency safety plan that is using a safety management system principles that is in compliant with 49 CFR part 673. The intent is to improve safety throughout a through a comprehensive collaborative approach that brings management and employees together to build on our existing safety foundation, controlling safety risks better, detect and de correct safety problems earlier, share and analyze the safety data more efficiently and measure our safety performance more carefully. Why should we do it? Well, one, the federal government says that we have to, but the other reason is public transportation is one of the safest ways to travel in the United States and transit passengers are 40 to 70 times less likely to be killed or injured when riding public transportation than driving or riding in a motor vehicle. But public transportation also has a chance of having catastrophic events. Several high profile events have happened over the past decade. There have been trains that have derailed. Um, there have been passengers who jumped on the tracks. There have been buses that have fallen into uh, sinkholes, major, cra major crashes. And the rates of fatalities and injury in public transportation have remained stagnant over the past decade, while rates in almost every other mode have declined significantly. 80% of all accidents and incidents are attributed to human error. And the majority of those errors are related to accidents due to <coughs> organizational weaknesses. Who is affected? Transit systems that receive FTA funds, Section 5307 funds, which would include High Point Transit, and then all rail transit operators, regardless of where they get their funding from. Through MAP 21 and the FAST Act, Congress required operators of public transportation systems that receive 5307 funds to implement a public transportation agency safety plan. And FTA is implementing this requirement through the PTASP final rule, which is 49 CFR part 673. The general requirements are that we comply with the public transportation safety program and the national public transportation safety plan, that there's the assignment of a chief safety officer or SMS executive, and it must be approved by the accountable executive and the board of directors or the equivalent authority by July 20th of 2020. Um, due to the pandemic though, FTA has waived enforcement until December 31st of 2020. There is also an annual review, update and certification of each agency's plan. This is sort of a diagram of from top to bottom and then also bottom to top of what is expected for SMS as well as for our agency safety plan. The accountable executive is responsible entirely for the execution and implementation or seeing that the plan is executed and implemented. Within that, there is a chief safety officer or an SMS executive, as well as the senior management of operations and maintenance are also there to help implement and operationalize our SMS. Our key staff, we've come together with the help of a consultant. We have put together SMS policies and we'll continue to put together more policies and procedures. But in the end, all transit staff are responsible for safety for identifying safety concerns and for reporting those through our employee reporting program. There are very specific elements that are required from our PTASP. We have to have the four components of a safety management system. We have to have safety performance targets. There are seven targets in four categories that are expressed both in number and in rates, and as well as an employee reporting program that allows all employees to report conditions to senior management that even has the ability for those reports to be completely anonymous. 
The four components of SMS are safety management policy, a safety risk management, safety assurance, and safety promotion. Safety management policy is commitment from the top level down that we are going to do things to promote a safe environment using everything, using all reasonable resources. Safety risk management get, has the staff identifying, assessing, and prioritizing what safety risks are out there. Safety assurance is once we've identified, assessed, and prioritized, we're now going to mitigate we're going to measure what our mitigation is doing and we're gonna to continue to monitor to make sure that the changes we have put in place or the new things that we have added don't cause additional risk. And the final component is safety promotion. That is where we begin communicating all of this to all transit employees and we begin training. Making sure that all employees are aware of what their responsibility is, as well as what is expected of them from a reporting standpoint and what methods they will have to be able to report. The safety performance measures that we are required to track and to report on are fatalities, injuries, safety events, and system reliability. As you notice here, I have security events in red and highlighted. It is an optional measure that we chose to provide, to put into our plan. We have noticed that we've been having more and more security incidents over the years. Um, and it has really come to light here, unfortunately, in the midst of COVID. And so I felt that this was a very important measure to track and to try to uh, mitigate those things and get those numbers lower than they are now. Safety reporting, it is completely voluntary. It is completely confidential or anonymous. And there are whistleblower protections. We have implemented to date, there are actually three ways that you can report safety, can, uh, safety issues. To the original one before we had a website developed was I send out a weekly email and in that there is always a link that will allow you to email, any employee to email me their safety concerns. Unfortunately, that does not allow for confidentiality. What we have worked with one of our vendors and we have created a website where the employee may enter their information to be followed up with and contacted if they so choose, but they do not have to making the comp report completely anonymous. Once the report is submitted, then it is entered into the system. And then we begin to review the request, analyze, document, and then go through. And then once we've come up with a action or no action plan, we report that information back to the employee or we post a general notice if we don't know who submitted it to let them know what is going to be done about that concern. And then we will continually follow the circle to monitor and make sure that the mitigations we put in place or the issues that have been addressed, that there aren't any other further issues and that it is completely taken care of. Before I hit the schedule, on the whistleblower protections, that does not prevent an employee though, who has done something that is completely, a complete violation of the rules that has reckless or was done with outright intention of uh, making a safety violation. So, if it's something small, something incident, a near miss, a true accident, then employees are protected. But if it is something that is willful and negligent, then there, are, there can be disciplinary actions for those issues. Where we are on our schedule, we started in March, we issued a notice to proceed uh, to, our con to the vendor who had selected to um, begin helping us put together everything. I had a initial phone call with the project manager assigned to us a few days later. Um, COVID came along, slowed us down, but in between um, March and August, the contractor did come on site for two days. He met with me, he met with all of the staff, all the senior staff, and then he did meet with some of the operations folks to talk about what they felt was our safety culture, 
What were the issues they would seeing? What were these things that he could put together as he was working on? Where were we in our SMS readiness assessment? He completed the assessment. I got that information in August. Um, and actually that should be August 19th. He submitted the draft PTSP. We worked through, we tweaked some things. And then on August 14th, he submitted the final PTSAP. I have that document, which is <clears throat> probably about 100 pages roughly. And that document will come before council, hopefully at the next meeting for an official approval. And then shortly thereafter, the city manager and the city cert attorney will go into trams and certify that all of this has been done. And I'm just gonna kind of give you, and I hope this will play, a short video that we did produce as part of the um, communication to the employees, because we actually did training last week on Tuesday and Wednesday for all employees minus the three who were not present for illness or had planned things off. And so uh, we've now given them a little training. And this is just sort of a quick video for all the, that all the employees saw that really talk, quickly talks about in under two minutes, the employee safety reporting program. And it's basically, have you ever wanted to report a safety violation, make a safety report? Here is track it ESR, which is what we've called it, that makes reporting just a scan away. We have posters that are posted throughout our facilities and they even have a little business card that looks like the one, I mean, you can carry it in your pocket in your wallet that has that QR code on it. And so if you have any mobile device, you can use your mobile phone with either your QR code or if you have a newer phone, your camera will automatically pick it up. You scan that code and it will take you to the website where you then can enter the information. And this is literally step-by-step. Step. It is very, very simple for any employee to do. They don't have to be at work. They can do it wherever they feel most comfortable. We still get the information we need and then they can still remain anonymous. And this is what the website actually looks like. gives them all the information they need to know and it is non-punitive reporting and there's a little box that they can check to make themselves anonymous but if not they can fill their name email phone number do they want feedback and then all the information about what they're reporting and it's simply click submit are there any questions All right. Thank you, Andrew. All right. Thank you, Andrew. So the uh, next is the um, minority uh, business support initiative. I think our own Cyril Jefferson is going to handle that. Sure. You wear two masks, though. Do I need to touch the dice while I do it? <laughs> while he's pulling that up, I'll, I'll talk briefly about it. I hope everyone's. While he's pulling that up, I'll talk briefly about um, what the presentation is in regards to. So you all may have seen in the news uh, covered by various media outlets, the announcement that came out last Wednesday where Dr. Cubane um, and the university have agreed to support a project that would establish the foothold of an effort uh, to support the development, growth, uh, and capacity building of minority and women-owned businesses here in our city. Um, that would come that would come with the provision of non-traditional financing, business coaching, entrepreneurial mentorship, and technical assistance to help businesses. Uh, and included in the presentation are a number of data that I'll share with you um, 
And mainly the reason why we're talking about it today is that, um, as you know, we've been doing a number of things this year as a body uh, to continue to move the ball forward and how we address diversity and inclusion. Obviously, our big, very robust diversity and inclusion initiative that's, that's shaping up and taking place um, is something that we're all really proud of. And so I feel like this proposal uh, is one that falls in line with it. Um, this is not a proposal for any direct action today. If anything, it's for council's consideration uh, and for us to maybe consider um, how it, for us to allow, I think, appropriate staff, the city manager to allow appropriate staff um, to look at the effort a little more closely to see where we might be able to provide support. Um, I think there's a myriad of ways that this can, can shape up uh, in other communities, um, how they choose to partner this kind of effort with their NWBE uh, purchasing policy or how they choose to let this, uh, in some ways, partner collaborate with their economic development and community development efforts um, is something that we can all consider. So essentially the community investment proposal is to strengthen High Point through collaborative development strategies. And it starts with this, the situations that High Point has tr experienced tremendous success historically due to our internationally recognized furniture, textile manufacturing and transportation industries. We also had great success with the uh, recent exceptional growth of our uh, great university and High Point University and then our burgeoning downtown revitalization efforts. Despite these accomplishments, I don't think any of us are unaware of the challenges that we still face, whether it's the poverty, rising crime rates, uh, food hardship and insecurity, homelessness and educational disparities. Those challenges, um, I believe, and I think plenty others believe, are the symptoms of a larger issue. In many cases, it's the lack of economic opportunity and vitality. Um, and so to provide a little more backdrop to it, there's the inequality effect that we look at here. And there's some quotes that I have listed. Um, I won't read them all in their entirety, but I'll paraphrase, uh, I will attempt to paraphrase. Um, and that's that uh, there is a long history um, in our country uh, of certain policies and practices that have kept um, African-Americans and other uh, minority communities from experiencing economic mobility through both legal and extra legal means. Um, we also know that the relationship between poverty and crime um, is a very, uh, it's a very prevalent one, not one that we can deny. Uh, continuing further, uh, we know that less equal societies have fewer stable economies. Uh, we know that living in an unequal society causes stress and other health issues. Uh, and then finally, that in inequality increases property crime and violent crime. And so uh, on the announcement last Wednesday, I shared a statistic that I thought was pretty, pretty important. The McKinsey um, and company corporate consulting firm provided some information that talks about the wealth gap between white families and black families. And it says that uh, the median white family had more than 10 times the wealth of the median black family in 2016. And then it talks about if we address this wealth gap, then the U.S. global domestic product could be four to six percent higher by 2028, translating to an increase of 2.9 to 4.3 trillion dollars in GDP per capita. Um, what that essentially says to me is that if we address this issue, it will have a positive and significant impact, not just on uh, those entrepreneurs and communities impacted directly as minorities, but it will have a significant impact on our community at large. So our resolve is that to address these challenges, uh, we have to look at opportunities for financial capital, startup support, professional opportunities, education and training to help move the ball forward. The solution components include education, workforce development, NWBE engagement, community-based lending and entrepreneurship support. A number of these things obviously do not fall into the city's wheelhouse. Um, they fall, obviously education falls into the wheelhouse of the county and our institutions for learning, workforce development. We know that we've already got a hand in that. Um, but we are looking at our NWBE engagement um, and then the other two uh, items listed here, community-based lending and entrepreneurship support are, are included in this proposal. And so I wanted to continue in providing a little more background that the city of High Point um, already has a really robust diversity and inclusion initiative um, that's been launched, which includes the improvement of personnel resolutions and our hiring policies, uh, the leadership training opportunities implemented for employees, mandatory diversity training for our supervisory employees, the funding and hiring of a new diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist, and the improving of our purchasing policy and developing strategies to engage more NWBEs. We also are doing great work in regards to workforce development. 
Um, and then we have a great strategic marketing initiative, which sort of looks at how we can frame our city, this international city and the revitalization that's going on, um, that it's not just the physical and economic manifestations of that, but that it is in many ways, um, our revitalizing, our push towards being that city on the hill and that city that truly is the single most livable, safe and prosperous community in America for all of our residents. So the proposal is that we look at community-based lending, entrepreneurship support and MWBE engagement um, through the High Point Community Investment Campaign. And what that is, is we launched a $1 million campaign that will provide non-traditional business financing, technical assistance, entrepreneurial mentorship and business coaching to support and grow minority and women owned businesses in the city of High Point. Uh, I'm happy to state that the campaign received an enormous boost through the generosity of one of our community's most visionary leaders and that's Dr. Cubain and HPU. Uh, during a press conference last week, he announced that the university is investing a challenge gift of $500,000 to the campaign uh, it would also provide support by where the talented faculty and staff given their expertise and skills to ensure the initiative's success. We have a list of potential stakeholders who we could see being involved who will continue to engage um, and we'll continue to have conversations with them about this. Um, and some of our next steps and what we've been doing thus far is looking at our project outline, timeline, objectives, roles and responsibilities. Our committee has been meeting to fine tune the details of it. We're looking to secure major stakeholders, stakeholders and coordinate with them and roll out the campaign. And so finally, I want to leave with this thought is that our city of High Point's mission uh, is that we aim to serve as the catalyst for bringing together the community's human, economic and civic resources for the purposes of creating a single most livable, safe and prosperous community in America. And if you look at our logo, whether it's on the back of our wall, on business cards that we give out and the clothes that we wear, we are North Carolina's international city. And I think that what those words embody is that we are a collective of diverse backgrounds, of diverse, diverse cultures. We have inclusive policies and we have inclusive practices. And we obviously wanna provide equity when it comes to opportunity. Um, the anchor institution to get this going obviously was Dr. Uh, was HPU and Dr. Neil Cubain. Uh, we believe that this project will build on the momentum that our city has gained these past few years and make real the possibilities of citywide revitalization for our citizenry at large. Um, I'm grateful for HPU support and I hope that um, as a council, we will consider in some ways getting behind this, um, at least for the time being while we do our due diligence and still work things out, if we'll at least allow the city manager uh, to direct and allow staff to at least maybe attend meetings and, and look at the stuff a little closer to see where there are opportunities. I couldn't say right now, you know, hey, the city should give money or the city should provide staff and I couldn't say that right now. I think that our staff, uh, and all their institutional knowledge probably have some ideas of what that could, could look like. And I think uh, just at least the permission to allow them to look at it um, helps. Thank you. Thank you, Are sir. Any questions, you, comments, or concerns? Do, do you have any idea um, once you begin trying to raise the, the 500,000 matching money, is there, is there a certain deadline for that or before you're Yeah, so, so Dr. Cubain said HBU is not putting a deadline on us raising that money. Mm -hmm. um, however, for us, we'd rather see it happen sooner rather than later. Sure. Um, based on the communications that we've had, the inquiries of folks reaching out, asking about the project, asking where they can send their checks, and the institutions who are ready to get behind this, I could see this actually shaping up and taking place around the beginning of 2020 run. Okay. 2021, sorry. Okay, thanks. And to anyone that wasn't at HPU last week when he gave his speech, Man, he was on fire. Zero, you did a really good job. <laughs> I only have one question. The, 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 no, 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 you can stay right there. The presentation <laughs> itself. <laughs> can, we, can we have a copy of the presentation itself? I know you had to kind of move through it pretty quick. Thank you. That's it. Perfect. Okay, is there anything else before we go into closed session? Okay. Hearing nothing. Uh, I will need a motion to go into closed session for purposes of economic development. So moved. Thank you. Motion has been made by um, the Mayor Pro Tem, Chris Williams. Is there a second? Thank you. I did seconded by uh, Councilman Cyril Jefferson. Um, okay, I will call the roll. Then. Uh, Councilman Holmes, how do you vote? Aye. Councilman Johnson? Aye. Councilwoman Peters? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Williams? Aye. Councilman Hudson? Aye. Councilman Jones? 
And the mayor votes aye, so that vote is approved. That motion is approved by a vote of eight to zero. We will now transfer over into closed session. I don't think we're gonna be taking action. You're not expecting any action, are you, Lauren? Okay, we're not expected to take any action after this, so chances are we'll come out of closed session just long enough to adjourn the special meeting uh, prior to our 5.30 regular meeting, just for those listening.
Wesley Hudson, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Chris Weaves. Is there any discussion on the adjournment? Hearing none, uh, is there anyone opposed to adjourning the meeting? Okay. Hearing none, then the special meeting of the city council is now adjourned. Okay. Now we can.